All right. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can put them in uh, or you can you can speak up and I will acknowledge you nameless students. OK. Um, all right. So what we're going to do with our with our volunteered imagery, some of which is handmade, some of which is downloaded off the Internet. What we're going to do is try to construct um, construct a basic kind of perspective and try to fit the imagery together so that it doesn't look like it's cut and pasted on top of each other in a way that is, let's say, bad or careless. Now, at the same time, we're going to try to embrace the fact that we are doing collage. And so these things are collaged together. But an understanding of the objects, both in their the ambiguity of their form and the specificity of the space that they're trying to imbue the atmosphere with is what we're gonna to try to keep in mind. The other thing that I want you guys to keep at the forefront of your mind when you're working on this stuff, I was just at a lecture by Perry Culper and he was talking about the fact that he is loath to start with a blank page and he is also loath to finish anything. He said, um, and this was not even an hour ago, he said, I try to leave every drawing indeterminate enough to give me baggage to take forward to the next drawing. I really like that way of saying it, which is that he doesn't try to finish a drawing because then you kind of start to think about what does it mean for it to be finished, but instead has it has it done the work that it needs to do and it has it asked a question that will be fulfilled by making making another uh, creating another image creating another visualization. Okay, so we've saved everything into Photoshop hiccups, which is a working folder on the desktop that will back up later. We have our, um, for demonstration purposes, we have our eight, eight inch by eight inch, 150 DPI Photoshop layer um, file here. And we've got all of these images. Now, since I've already selected out, we, we hunted down a bunch of different images already from the cabin competition to entourage to facades that we're working on. From that kind of hunting session where we got stuff from our own records our own archives, our own photography, and the internet, we've kind of selected already ones that we want to work on. That's really important because you'll want to open up everything all the time. So I'm going to pick all of these and I'm just going to open them up and they're going to populate on the top of Photoshop right here. And as they're doing that, it gives me a chance to see them. Cool. There we go. Lots of texture. All right. So first thing I want to point out, which is it's really nice that if you have a library of PNG files, then you automatically have a cutout silhouette that you can snag and put into any section. So if we move to someplace like here, uh, let me just grab this scale figure on this PNG layer by hitting a little copy action right there. And then we'll just go to this one and I can hit paste. And you can see that it's the work, the hard work of cutting this scale figure out is already there. So that's really nice. That's one of the nice things about if you draw on a scale figure and you enjoy that scale figure and you do a little bit of the work to save it as a PNG, which means that the background gets saved as this nil checkerboard, you've already, you're already well on your way to kind of having scale figures in the future. Um, and of course you can, since we have a perspective here, by some careful use of perspective, we can get these scale figures to match and align. Now, one of the general rules of thumb, when you're doing an architectural perspective, which might be a either a one point or a two point perspective, but there's no foreshortening in the, in the vertical axes. That means that your walls go straight up. They don't skew to the side. So this is a perspective corrected image. We actually want the eye level of these individuals to line up. And we're gonna use the door to help us match the scale of those human beings. So since this is a perspective, they need to be in proportion. So there is someone entering the door. Now, obviously, if we put this guy next to him, that guy is a, a you know regular sized human being. And this is an extra large human being. So instead, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the, the eye line lines up. And I can make it feel like one of them is in front of the other 
by making the line of their eyes line up. So that's just like kind of the first rule of thumb for perspective making. And we can make an even smaller person or somebody in the foreground, again, by lining their eyes up or by, and I'm just using the transform tool, which is a shortcut, control T. So you can see that person is on now on the edge of the staircase. And if I make him smaller, so they are now in the background and they're walking up. So it'll be a lot easier. I'm just gonna put in a layer. While I'm working on stuff, I usually work with a background layer that's a color. Um, sometimes if I want to specifically acknowledge that it's just a ridiculous color, uh, I will make it a ridiculous color on purpose. So I'll make it something like red or green or blue. Um, if I'm working late at night uh, and the room is not very bright, I will make it black so that the room is not as, so that my computer screen is not as high contrast, that puts less strain on my eyes. Um, and if I'm working in the middle of the day or I'm working on a final draft, I will make the background color white so that it looks like it's floating on the piece of paper. And I often try to work on a frame with lots of white space around. I usually try not to get an instance like this where I have a person engaging the frame unless that's actually something that I'm designing into my presentation. I usually try to let things float away from the white, the edge of the space so that I can arrange them cleaner together. But for the purposes right now, there we go. We've got our people. All right, there's one last trick I wanna show you guys just to get a good sense of distance really and depth in a drawing really fast. And this can happen in a section, a plan, as well as a perspective. And that's by going into these layers, I'm gonna unlock, this guy got locked. I'm gonna unlock this layer. And I'm just gonna add some transparency. Oh, and I added the white to the background. So we're gonna just need to add a new layer here, new layer. Add to the background, move that in the stack back, paint it white, there we go. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, as things move towards the background, and you might be familiar with this if you've ever been out in the Pennsylvania countryside in a hazy, humid August day, or if you're at the top of Broad Street looking towards City Hall or coming down 95, you'll see that the city or the, or the mountains in the background kind of become hazy and gray, which is where they get the name Blue Mountains. Um, and so what we have here is that you get this foreshortening because of transparency, because of this like haziness. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take each one of these individuals and I'm just gonna make them a little bit grayer. And I can do that by either making them transparent, which I'm gonna do here, and this is a stylistic choice to make your scale figures kind of translucent so you can see through them. Or you could change them and make them gray. I'll show you both ways to do this. So this is what it looks like to do the transparency. I'm going to remove this construction line so you guys can see that their, their eyesight is all lining up. It makes them feel grounded. If we actually move these layers around, they would feel like they were hopping or jumping. Uh, and while that could be fun for what we need to do right now, not so useful. Right, so having this guy up here on the roof, not, not as useful uh, in this moment. Of course, the other thing that we could do really quickly to make this more enjoyable and more demonstrative section would be to have people using the space and engaging with the space th that demonstrates how you would envision it being used. So if you had a person and they were, I'm just gonna hold control and click my layer so I can grab the layer really quickly. So if the person's actually like, grabbing the handrail or grabbing the yeah, grabbing the handrail or grabbing the door that's more helpful um, to kind of give us a sense of how that space is getting utilized all right so here you can see the full effect of just kind of adding gray it makes it seem like there's more depth let me do the inverse of that so that you guys can see what the effect is if we take that away so when we make that scale figure full on black, you can see that it kind of moves their presence forward in the composition, although 
skill and proportion wise in the space, they remain in the background. And that kind of perceptual dissonance kind of kind of twangs in our mind. Um, so the other way to do it would be to go to the adjustment layers here. And what we could do is we could either mess with the brightness and contrast and we could make we can make it more more or less bright. That would work, but because we have a silhouette, there is no brightness or contrast that we can adjust. So instead what we can do is that we can go into levels right here and we can adjust it to be more gray. So I'm going to basically grab the output level slider here and just move it up into the gray area. And that's going to take the blackest pixels and make them this shade of gray. Uh, I can also do it from the other end and it'll kind of gray out the background. This can be helpful if you want to make something pop. So just look at the way that, uh, look at the way that this student had modeled the uh, railing and look at how it changes when we make the background gray. See how it brings the railing to the forefront? I'm not saying that one way is better than the other. It just changes the way that we perceive it. Now here, it feels like it's oddly glowing. But this way, it kind of feels like it's a gray rainy day and that, that railing is kind of catching some light in a different way. It's kind of bringing it forward in a way that it feels more weighty when we're looking at it here. See here, the railing looks like it's light and light, lightweight. Here, the railing looks a little bit heavier. I'm not saying that one way is better or the other. It's just what is the work that you want it to do? So let's just go with a little bit of gray in the background here, and we'll make that background shadow kind of dark. All right, we'll take we'll take the we'll put these guys in order in the layers. Ah, here we go. Very nice. So the other thing that this student has done is they've already made a PNG out of this. And the nice thing about that is we can immediately move the person behind the door because they've already done the hard work of cutting out the doorway, which is really nice. Um, Andrew, what if, what if we decided that we didn't want, that we wanted a big piece of glass and we hated these artifacts that existed in here? Well, we can fix that in just a moment. Let's set the gray on this figure by going again into layer, uh, into layers, in, sorry, into image adjustments and levels. You can see that you can get there by clicking control L. And let's just adjust the gray level on that fella to not quite what the other one was. And we'll adjust the opacity back up to 100%. All right, now let's go in and fix these artifacts because by moving this figure, and I like this way of working where kind of one thing leads to the next. So you're not trying to fix everything at once. You're just trying to work your way around the visualization to kind of fix issues as they arise. So you can see that there's actually some artifacts up here in this part of the million, but when we zoom out, we don't actually see it. It kind of gives a little bit of a texture and a roughness to that edge, actually along the wood here. If we zoom way in, it looks really kind of chunky, but as we zoom out, it gives it kind of a nice texture. So in those instances, it's not a problem, but here we're getting something that we don't want. So I'm gonna just zoom in and select my pixels really carefully. And of course, you know, Photoshop means I can always back up if I don't like what I've done, but I'm gonna try to grab most of that. And we're gonna activate the view that the layer that that's on, and we're just gonna cut it out. Now you can see that that cuts a really, really crisp line. But one of the problems with that is it makes this door feel a little bit flat. So let's go back, we'll hit undo, control Z. And instead on the selection, let's go to edit. And we're gonna add a, we're gonna add a little bit of a, uh, uh, sorry, we're gonna go to select. And we're going to add a feathered edge to it. So what we're going to do is instead of growing, we're going to say that we want to, here we go. Sorry, it has moved on me. We're going to feather the edge by two pixels. And this means it's going to kind of round off those pixels. So let's just zoom in and see how that went. Uh, not quite what we wanted, 
but it did work a little bit on this left hand side. So we need to select just a little bit more. Let me show you guys. Let me show you guys what this feathered edge is going to look like when I zoom in here. So here's a selection with a feathered edge of two pixels, and you can see that effect. Here is a feathered edge with one pixel. Reselect it. And you can see that it gives you a little bit of a roundness to that by kind of shading that. So what we're going to do, I'm going to grab this again. We have our feathered edge set at one pixel. Work our way down here, grab these and hit X. And there you can see that it's pulled out some of that, but it's left a few of those artifacts in there. This bottom still needs to get cleaned up a little bit. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to select not quite what I want right in here. And now to get the rest of that, I think I'm actually going to use the, I'm going to use the eraser tool, but I'm going to mask this off by selecting the edge and I'm going to grab my eraser. I'm going to set it as a hard edge, relatively big circle. And I'm just going to go in there and kind of gently kiss those pieces. And the nice thing about, you can see where I pre-selected is that the eraser isn't going to, and let me work over here in the black area just so you can see what that means, is that the eraser won't work outside of that region. So you can see that I'm erasing across this, but the eraser is not working outside of the region that I have masked off. That's a really handy tool. Um, if I mess up, of course, I can go back. I have my history open all the time. History will take you back about 50 spaces, um, but it is permanent. So once you've saved it and you've closed the file and opened it back up, it is permanent. All right, so we've fixed the issue with the door, but it now just kind of barely looks like the, the scale figure is, uh, is behind it. Again, I'm gonna hold down control and click on the scale figure and that warps me to the layer that that fella is on. I'm just gonna move him over a little bit next to the door, just so that he's cut off by the door jam a little bit to give the impression of that depth. And there's one more thing that's happening, and that's I'm realizing that we should see the railing back there. Now, I could go back into the Rhino model and remodel the railing, but I don't got time for that. So what instead I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out this part of the drawing right here. And I'm going to try to not grab this triangular little bit of gray right here. I'm going to try to cut this part out right here. I'm going to copy and paste it and put that in. If I hold shift, I can move it along right here. I'm gonna put it in front of the door and I'm gonna stretch it to go beyond the door. Hit enter to make that happen. And then we're gonna move it behind both of those figures and behind that figure. Looks pretty good. There's some walkiness to the shadow. So I'm going to keep editing that layer. And we're going to use the uh, dodge and burn tool. So we're going to use the burn tool here. And what that does is you'll see it just kind of darkens that up a little bit. And it just gives it a little bit more shadow effect back there. Now, before I go any further, I've been editing. I have about six separate layers. When I started out, I only had one layer. So before I go any further, I might need to go to dinner. And then when I come back, I'm not going to remember which layer is which layer. I might have little tiny pieces. So let's do a real quick moment of pause since we've kind of finished the first bit of our work here. And let's just name everything really carefully, really quickly. So I'm just going to double click and say, that's the cabin. I'm going to turn that guy on and off and say uh, person inside. I'm going to put this on and off and say person foreground. Uh, we're going to go down here again, just turn that on and off person at door. I'm going to select that on and off. That's a little bit more of the railing fixed. gray sky, background person. And, oh, don't want a group. Don't need a group. 
white background. Take this even further. And I'm just thinking it would be nice to have our horizon line in here. The horizon line is actually at the eye level of all these individuals. The horizons actually, you see the horizon at the level of your eyes. People kind of think that it should be at the level of your feet, but it's at the level of your eyes. So we're just gonna add layer, new layer. I'm gonna name this layer sky. Every time you add a new layer, you can actually add it, um, the name right away. I am going to drop that control line and I'm just grabbing that with the move tool, grabbing a ruler and moving it down to here. I'm gonna grab the rule line, grab selection, select that area. I know this is super boring for about half of you guys. I'm gonna paint this white. Uh, I can clear these guides off by moving them out of the way. I'm gonna move the sky here. You can see like I already got a sense of kind of a, a gravity or a ground just by giving a little sense of a horizon. And that can happen by adding a line or some gray. It can also happen by inverting it. So let me just do it this way. So this way works as well. So interestingly enough, whether the sky is gray or the sky is white, it still works. Um, we still have a transparent opacity on this fella. So he's looking a little wonky. All right. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a, a, a thumbs up emoji if the ground should stay white. Give me a uh, give me a laughing face emoji if the ground should if the sky should stay white. What do you guys think? Laughing face emoji, sky should stay white. All right, so we're gonna keep it uninverted. All right, no snow. Only one person wants it to be snowy on the ground. Okay, all right. The, uh, the white skies have it. Now I wanna point out something here though. The ground is not green and the sky is not blue. And the effect of that is that instead of doing that, Let's just let's just make the sky RFB really flipping blue. Let's make the sky really blue just for a moment. Just so you guys can experience what that feels like. When we make the sky really blue or lavender in this case or like straight up sky blue. Um it does give us the word sky. But I want you to look compositionally at what's happening. The whole composition has gotten heavier and the focus has moved more, a little bit, a half a degree more towards the background and less about this one room cabin that we're looking at. So let's just back up in the history and let's look at it when it's white. Look at where your eye goes immediately. Your eye starts to inhabit the architectural space. For me, this is an argument not because the landscape is not important, it's because the landscape is important, but it keeps the focus on what it is that you want to pay attention to. And I'll leave this as, and I'll leave this as uh, a, a um, I'm gonna leave this as a white sky background. Um, and for some reason, our pole keeps uh, going up here. And I don't know why. Uh, that was my fault. I was, yeah. I didn't realize I was a host. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. You're making a, everybody's a co-host today. So, uh, so it means that you guys, since you guys are co-hosts, it means that you guys can um, annotate on the screen or you can type questions on my Photoshop as I'm working on it. So if you, uh, I do it to you guys. So it's only fair for you to mess with the professor. I have no problem with you guys adding questions to say like, what does this do? What about this? Um, all right. As a matter of fact, let's give that a trial run right now. Can you guys draw a, uh, a really crappy tree on the screen for me right now? Oh, and I'm going to break Photoshop by just doing that. Sorry. All right. It's working. Thank you. All right, we've got a, we've got a, thank you. We have our, our cheesy tree, trees. All right, here's our forest. 
All right, there's another thing that's going on in this drawing, which is that it's a section perspective. So before I go any further, while you guys are drawing trees, uh, can I ask the author of this, can you just outline in red, uh, Mr. NV, can you outline in red the, uh, the section that you're chopping through this one room cabin? And I'm gonna follow along with this piece right here. I wanna show this section line here. Yeah. And I'm just gonna try to follow along and grab that section as best as I can. Now there's a couple different ways that we can do this and all good Photoshop, I like the Christmas tree, very festive. I'm just gonna close this shape. So if you guys can see for just a moment where that outline is, I've kind of grabbed just a little bit of where this is. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit here. And when you're selecting stuff by holding shift, you can add to the selection. So where I've messed up, I can actually add on by hitting shift. And I can also by, uh, by hitting alternate, I can fix where I've over selected. So I'm just going to go over here and just fix where I've over selected just a little bit. I'm gonna zoom back out so that your trees fit into the sky here, okay. Um, and I'm gonna make this a called out section that I can use later. So I'm gonna create a new layer and I'm gonna call it section cut. And I'm gonna misspell it horribly because that's who I am. I'm gonna say, okay. And I'm just gonna drop a, uh, a brilliant red because the author used red and I'm gonna use red. He followed instructions and we're just gonna plant it in there right now. And what you can see is all of a sudden, and I'm gonna ask you guys uh, if you can just hide, if you guys can use the eraser tool and just hide your trees for a moment. And then you can always use the untool, undo tool and your trees will come back. Um, but what you can see is that we have now, we have a really clear language of where the section is cut. Now I made it red just to be, to prove my point, but it doesn't have to be red. Um, as a matter of fact, we could change it to be other colors. We could either use the paint bucket to dump color in there, or we could use uh, hue saturation and we could make it really red, or we could just make it gray. We can make it uh, we can use hue to change the colors. So if there is a color scheme that we're going for, we could try to match it. Um, give me thumbs up if it should stay. Oh yeah, we're definitely using construction orange. Uh, if it should stay gray, give me the confetti cannon if it should go brown. Give me the laughing if it should stay really super orange. Thumbs up for gray, laughing for orange. So, all right, oh man, okay. All right, we're staying construction orange. You guys got my heart. All right, so we're gonna stay construction orange. Now it's time to add a few more conventions. Uh, we have the section cut on here. And can you guys see where I added that little tiny bit of detail right here? And I, actually, let's clean it up. This is the mullion where the window is. Let's continue to clean that up by just dumping some more uh, bucket in there. Uh, I have a key color of orange now, so I'm gonna just hit alternate. By hitting alternate, my cursor turns to a eyedropper, which allows me to match a color, and I can just bucket in there. Uh, I still have a feathered edge at the moment, so I'm just gonna kind of zoom in on this, even that out with a rectangle, grab the bucket again, uh, we're going to make sure that, and there we go. Nubbin. There we go. And I can even go one more level of detail. Uh, let's just add another layer. Every time I have a level of detail, I just add another layer. Um, let's just do a ground line. And let's add another layer. And we'll call it 
and glazing. All right, now, um, in the chat, what color should the glass be? And I'm gonna add, while you guys are typing in what color the glass should be, I am going to add the ground line. So the ground line is going to be a line right here. And we can add it in a couple of ways, but I'm going to add it like this, straight across here. So this is a Photoshop way, drawing way of doing it. Blue, blue, light purple, transparency. OK. All right, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to flip this to black. Now, we could do a fill as the ground. So we could do like we did for the section, and we could just dump a color in there and make it black. But that's going to make it sit really, really heavy on the page. Instead, the drawing convention would be to do a really, really dark line. And so instead, what I'm going to do is that we're going to use, uh, we are going to use stroke. Do, 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 as soon as, and this is the part where I freak out because I'm like, where did I put it? Where did I put it? And I put it here, feather zero. And we're going to do this like that. Andrew, where is it? Where is it, Andrew? You use it all the time. And now, in the moment, you can't find it. Edit. There it is. OK. Sorry. Sometimes when you have these things by muscle memory, and then you're trying to narrate what it is, it gets really frustrating. Have you been there? I'm sure that you guys have been there, right? You've been in homework and you're like, what is it that Andrew said in class? What was the word that he said? What was the word that he said? What was the word that he said? He said stroke. I knew it was in, I have a kind of a top 10 tools for every program that I use. And in Photoshop, history is like one of the top ones. Magic wand, it's a Spider-Man tool. Sometimes it really, it can be used for evil, but I do love it. But image, Adjustments, top 10. Edit, usually what I'm looking for is in edit. Select, if it isn't in image or edit, it's usually in select. And the one that I never, ever, ever use, but I always get, when I get really bored, I find myself experimenting in, is filter. We do not want to use filter. All right, so what we're going to use now is called the stroke tool. And what this is going to do is it's going to stroke a line that follows the selection box. So let's make it five pixels centered on the inside. And we're going to say, OK. And what you will see is that we've just got a big, dark, stroked line right there. And now I'm going to cut this away right here because we don't need it. I'm also going to take the section cut. I'm going to cut that away because we don't need it. And I'm going to paste it back. And we're just going to leave this as white. Adjustments, brightness contrast, make it super bright. So let's just see what we got there for now. All right, so we have the ground. The ground is white. We have a section line. That section line could actually be a little bit darker. We have some line work on there. Because we've successfully made a line, of course, now we could copy and paste that as much as we wanted to. So we could grab that line and keep drawing with it. So if you're going to make a lot of lines, I recommend moving over into Illustrator. But if you need to make a few lines, you can make a few lines by cut and pasting them. It's not the best practice, but if you need to fix a few little things, it's totally a doable thing to do. Um, before we get out of control, though, I'm going to delete those. All right, you guys said that the glass should be blue. And that happens a lot, because if you stack up the glass and you look along its edge, it's usually green or a bluish color. But normally, when we put glass in, let me show you guys what it looks like if we put in a big blue box right here. So let me put this in like that. And let's do a color fill. And let's make it brilliant blue. 
right? Because the sky is blue, the ground is green, the sun is yellow, and that is what our crayons taught us. So, I don't know. Do you guys like it? It kind of looks like a big blue line. I'm kind of... Mm. Well, one thing we could do is that we could mess with the opacity because we are making a rendering. And so we could kind of hint at it right here. But you can see that as we make it more opaque, more, sorry, more transparent, it just kind of fades away into nothing. Uh, that doesn't quite work as well. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna say, let's do an edit and we'll do the stroke command again. Let's do it to the center. Let's do it one pixel wide. And instead, let's make the color white. Watch what happens. All of a sudden, we've got this very delicate line in there. Now, one pixel wide might not be wide enough. So I'm going to just undo, move back to the rectangular marquee. And I'm going to say edit. And I'm going to say stroke. We're gonna do it to the center. We're gonna do it two pixels wide and we're gonna not do it quite white. We're gonna do it the gray color of the sky, just a little whiter than that and say, okay. Now I've drawn that on the same layer as my ground line, which is not very helpful. I'm just gonna cut this out for a minute and cut away those two little pieces. This deserves to not be on the ground line. This deserves to be on its own layer and cut that away. But I've got two white lines here. I'm gonna just chop that whole thing out and paste it before I lose it because it's so gosh darn tiny. Before I lose it, I'm gonna put it where it needs to go and I'm going to link it to the section. So watch what I'm gonna do over here. I'm gonna hold control and click it, click this section, sorry. All right. Oh, hang on. Got to set apply the transformation. I'm going to hold control. I'm going to click the section and I'm going to hit this little chain button. And that's going to link that together. Actually, I want the ground line to stay linked together as well. So I'm going to hold control and add these together and hit the chain button. And this way, if I move them, they all move in the same way. Since I don't want any changes to be made to them anymore, I could also select them and I could lock the layer. Um, usually I don't lock layers, but let's just do that right now. Let's lock these layers so that we don't change them. And let's make sure that we add this as glass lines. Okay. It is time to plant the tree. I'm going to ask, uh, can somebody, I'm going to just, uh, erase this. Nothing against your tree. Just going to erase your tree for a minute. All right. Uh, we'll go back to the mouse. Okay. So. Now what I'm going to do, we're going to plant a tree in this area right here. Actually, we're going to plant a forest of trees because just planting one tree is not good enough. So we've got some selections here. This is an online version, but let's just go with what happens if we want to edit a tree, you know, from a drawing that we have. Um, I really like combining hand drawing with computer drawing. I think it makes it look better. So first, what we got to do is do a really quick cleanup. Thank you for the addition of this tree. So we're going to do a really quick cleanup. So before we move over there, let's do a save file on this. So we're going to say save as. I always keep a backup. So we already saved this as Photoshop demo, but let's save this as the Photoshop demo and five o'clock. Five o'clock. That way I have a backup in case I did something that I realized I wanted to do. I usually have like three backups just in case. I'm gonna say okay. And then we're gonna go over to our hand-drawn tree over here. Excellent. All right, this is a good photograph, but you can see that it's a little bit gray. It's not truly black or white. So I'm gonna free it up from the background here. Layer from background. Okay. And we're gonna make just a layer here that is going to help us maintain our kind of color palette. We'll go click on this to make it black and white. And that square will be black. And this square will be white. 
There we go. And you guys can see, as soon as we do that, you can see how not white the background is and how not black the, and it's pretty black. This is a really good photo. We've got good color differentiation, but we can make it better. So it's gonna look dingy if it shows up on our computer screen. So if I just cut and paste this out right now like this, cut, cut, and then bring it over and paste it, it's gonna look like a, a relatively dingy tree here in the background, all right? We can make it a little bit smaller. Now it looks like a dingy, it's gonna look like a dingy out of proportion tree, okay? Let's keep moving him to the back. So still looking like we can do some more work. The other thing though that I wanna keep as we're working on the tree over here, let's bring him back, is there's some smudging and there's some texture from the paper that's just kind of a wonderful thing. So what I'm gonna do right now, normally I would do this across the entire image. So I would do levels. Remember you can get to levels up here, image adjustments levels, but also you can use control L. So I'm gonna use control L to bring up the levels, control L. And this shows me a map, a pictogram of all of the truly black pixels, truly white pixels and truly gray pixels. Um, I can do this a couple of ways. I can mess around with it this way and you'll see that this is actually, this drawing has a, is a color image and so it has the warmth of the light in the room. You can see that it has a hot spot towards the top, which means the lamp in the space was towards the top of the image. And you can see as we truncate these closer together, it starts to kind of bring out data and we can get a clearer vision of this tree. But let's just say that I'm happy with this. This is gonna show us a couple of problems. So number one, we've got what we call artifacts, which is these really bright yellows and fiery spots. Um, you can see that we're getting some chunkiness and some digital kind of remnants. Um, because the picture is really nice, yeah, it does. It looks deep fried in this moment. It looks deep fried, I like that. Um, so what we wanna do is try to nudge it with a little bit more care and affection. So let's try to bring this down to here. Let's try to bring this up slowly. And I'm gonna tell you, every single sketch is a little bit different. So we're just gonna move it a little bit. And when we start getting some of that texture and it gets a little too crunchy, a little bit too French fries, we're gonna back off. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna back off a lot more from where we're at right now. It's starting to look better. So that you guys can see what I'm doing, I'm gonna do something that I don't advocate for you to do. So I'm gonna select this area and I'm just going to edit this area. Image, adjustments, levels. Now what should happen is that it will only make those changes in that area. And that way you can see what we're doing. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this level layer up here so you guys can see the impact of those changes. All right, so that we have, just so that you can see kind of some consistency with what it looks like. All right, so here and levels. All right, so let's look at this. You can see the pictogram is different in this area because I'm not having to deal with the hotspot of the upper part of this screen. So I'm not editing the entire drawing. Now, some things are happening that I like. As we start to make it blacker, do you guys see how there's some smudginess around those lines? I really like that effect. That's an effect that would be hard to duplicate in Photoshop. That's something that I like about a hand drawing. But you can see that it's not quite where it should be here. It's getting to be a little crunchy. Since, since this is not a color drawing and the color is not important for it, before I go any further, I'm gonna get rid of the color in this image. So I'm gonna hit cancel. I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna select it again, edit, adjustments, and we're gonna to go to hue saturation and we're gonna take all of the saturation out of the image. You can see this is all the color information. If I overclock it, you can see just how warm the, that, that light is. So I'm gonna take it all the way to zilch. That's a black and white gray image. 
look at that difference right there. Image. And now we're going to go in and do levels. This is a lot for a tree, right? But no matter what you do this for, for a tree, it's going to work. The other thing that's great about this is that once we have this tree edited, we'll have it forever. And we can use it in every single rendering from here until forever. So we're going to get the white pretty close. And then we're going to adjust this gray so that we can keep either the smudginess or the depth of those pixels. And it's a little bit of a game here. If you can see this on your computer on my screen, I've got just a little bit of gray in here. But if I take it too far, I lose the depth of the foliage that I think is really interesting and beautiful. So I'm going to leave it with a little bit of that gray. Oh, and my black got messed up. If it gets messed up, you can just restart. All right, the black to there. I want the white right to this peak right there. And I'm going to move the gray around. I think I like that. All right, look at the difference that we're at already. Now, I've been taking a long time just to talk about the nuance of this. But the fact of the matter is, is that once you practice this, it becomes automatic. We spent a lot of time on this tree. But you can do this edit in like 30 seconds once you realize what is important. I just wanted to break it down so you guys can see why those elements are, are so important. So to do the rest of our edits, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cut this out. And take it into a new file. I'm just going to paste it in here. So we can just look at it in terms of its own self. All right, so there's some cleanup that we need to do to this image. First of all, I want to get rid of some of these gray lines. And I'm just going to cut out some of these lines that are here. I'm just using the cut tool to kind of make some erasing. But I want to keep the texture that's in here. And so I'm going to go over to this. And I'm just going to kind of chop that out. And we're going to zoom in a little bit. Remember, I dig this texture. So I'm going to try to keep it. Because this is what's going to give it that handcrafted look. I kind of like the ghost of those pieces. I'm cutting those out. And now I'm going to go back to that dodge and burn tool again. So we're going to use the burn tool. And we'll make this nice and big. And we'll make it like a softer edge. And I can kind of burn this in a little bit more. Grab the shadows. A lot of change here. Exposure. It's not getting a lot of change. Try to dodge some of this out. There we go. The dodge tool is working a lot better on this particular image. Sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. I'm going to just dodge out this right here. Cut this out a little bit more. I'm going to grab my feathered tool. I'm going to put one pixel of feather on this so I can keep my ground line. But I like this rough edge, and I want to keep the rough edge. So I'm just going to kind of follow this drawing. I like the ground line. I think we're going to actually reuse this ground line here. There we go. It's a little chunky. Back up. A lot of clicking. I'm trying to work in small lifts so that I can get what I want. All right, so we've cleaned up the drawing a lot. Let's just clean up down this way a little bit, right here. And we're just about done. All right, one more time with the levels. 
And you can see that the pictogram has been changing every single time. So we have a lot less white pixels now. We can kind of move stuff around. We can move the constraints of the whole thing around. You can see where I've actually cut the tree out. We can move the black a little bit darker to make it more kind of gray. So let's just make this a little bit darker, a little bit less white in the edges. There we go. All right. Now, we're about to move this over to rendering. There's two ways that we can do this. We could cut it out like a sticker, or, and this is my favorite thing to do, we can peel the ink off the page. So cutting it out would just be cut and paste. But I'm going to show you guys how to peel the ink off the page right now. And this is one of my favorite tricks to do to help bring the life of a hand drawing into the ease of a computer perspective. If you practice this one wonky, strange thing, right? So here's the clickbait. This is the one weird tool that I'm going to teach you today. So we're going to click on this using the magic wand. We're not going to left click. We're going to use right click. We're going to right click and we're going to say color range. Now, I will tell you, I always do this wrong the first time. We're going to zoom in. And we're gonna, we're gonna select either the white pixels or the black pixels. Every drawing has a different personality. But what we're gonna try to do is peel the black ink off of the page. We can select the black ink by doing this and then increasing the fuzziness. And because we've done a good job editing the levels, there's not a lot of haze around here. When I say okay, it'll show you that we've got the black lines. And when I cut them out, it's gonna look like that. And we're going to go back to our cabin and we're going to hit paste. And what you're going to see is that we have a beautiful tree of black lines. Let me put it in the forefront here and let me edit it. For oh, for that again. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is just the black lines of the tree. And if you zoom in, you can see that we just have those black lines and they're a little bit gnarly. So now I'm going to show you the other way to peel the ink off the page. Same use of the tools. I'm going to get rid of this. Same use of the tools. So I'm just going to back up. So we've used levels. We've kind of ooched this to where we wanted it. We've used burn and dodge and the eraser tool. Those are the two only tools that you need to use for this. It's very easy. It was, a, it was just a picture from somebody's desk. Now, I'm going to go down to the magic wand. And instead of left clicking, I'm going to right click. All right. Now, instead of clicking on the black ink, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click out here on the white pixels. And we're going to say color range. So, right. So, Right click, color range. Now I'm selecting the white pixels, not the black pixels, the white pixels. Not the black pixels, the white pixels. But Andrew, we need to pull the ink off of the page. Why are you selecting the paper? Watch this. When I say OK, and then I, I decrease the fuzziness, do you see how it picks up more and more of the tree? Let me decrease the fuzziness all the way so you can see what that selection looked like. This is the best way to select every pixel that is not white. Because what I've done now is that I've selected every single pure white pixel. I'm going to right click again and I'm going to say select inverse. So let's do that one more time. Okay. Color range. I'm going to do the magic wand, color range, right click, color range, select the white. And then I can adjust the fuzziness however I want it to be to select the white pixels or the barely white pixels. I'm going to select the white pixels for this demonstration. It's now selected all of the white pixels. We're not done yet. Right click one more time, select inverse, control X, and everything is peeled off the paper. We're going to go over to our Photoshop. I'm going to paste it in. And you'll see that it's brought along some of the gray and some of the other colors. Now, 
you can see that it's also brought in the white. And because we have this white backdrop, it kind of makes it look a little weird. So stay with me. Last time, I promise. We're just going to go back one more time. All right. So magic wand, color range. Select the white pi pixels. Increase the fuzziness. To where you think it feels good. This is this is very much by feel. It's kind of trial and error. And that's the beautiful thing about a computer. You can always undo. So we selected not all of the white pixels, but some of the white pixels and some of the lightest gray pixels. We can now say select inverse, cut, and you'll see it's left a little bit of its ghost. That's important because when we paste it, you're going to see that it's a lot more natural in the way that it has these pieces. So let me turn off the two other trees. Turn off that tree. And we'll turn off that tree. And let's move this guy in. And you can see that we've got this really beautiful tree right here. Let's move it down in the stack. All the way down, all the way down, but not put the sky behind it. There we go. Oh. All right. So there's our tree. Now it still looks a little funky. And so what we actually need to do is zoom out. So I'm going to increase my canvas size. Uh, I'm going to make my canvas size 12 by 12 for this image. So let's just select that and accept that problem. All right, there we go. Image canvas size. Actually, let's do, let's think of double. Let's make it 16 by 16. I would always rather have more white space around my drawing than have too much, than have, uh, ha and then start to work with the, uh, grabbing the, um, the edges. Because you'll start to design to the frame. You'll start to have stuff that sticks to the frame. And instead, I really want a forest to put in here. So let's just plant this tree here. Uh, and we can plant it. We can even make it more life size. And actually, we can move this tree now up in the stack. And instead of having a computer like line, we can have that wonderful ground line right there. Of course, I can copy and paste that tree now. And if I really like that ground line, I could just make it longer. And of course, if I don't like the tree in that proportion, I can just say, that's fine. I can cut the tree down. And now I have that handmade ground line. I don't know what you guys think, but I like it a lot better than the computer line. I like the accuracy of the computer with the kind of handmade drawings. I actually have a bunch of PNGs of lines that I've drawn that I really like that I just copy and paste again and again in Photoshop. Um, since these two pieces go together, we're going to chain them together. And since they can stay together forever, I'm just going to say merge layers. Um, this is a cabin that's in the woods, though. It's not by itself. So I actually want to keep duplicating that layer. So let's go back here to cut the pixels. I'm going to cut the pixels out again. And I'm going to plant that tree again. Now, something that's going to happen is that we're going to become very aware of the fact that this is repeating a lot um, the more that we see this. Our eyes are so accustomed to seeing pattern. Um, let me continue to get it in the right. So one of the other things I like about this is rather than using, and we'll use, um, we'll use the, uh, we'll use the computer generated trees in a moment, but the more photorealistic it looks, the more photorealistic we expect it to be. And really the conversation we're having is not, is this realistic? The conversation we want to have is, is this design doing what you intended it to do? And so what 
what we really should be focusing on is as we're moving these things around is do I need to have the most realistic tree possible or is that really the best use of my time? And I would submit to you that it's not the best use of your time. The best use of your time is to try to get a tree that's on here and get it situated and move on with your life. So we're gonna duplicate this layer. Do, 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 do. All right, there we go. I'm going to paste another tree on. I'm going to paste another tree on. Now you can, you guys can see that the pattern is starting to evolve, right? But we are getting a density in the forest here, which is nice. So what we need to do now is make sure that the pattern. doesn't take over. In order to do that, we need to differentiate between the trees. And we're going to do that the same way that we did at the start of this when we went over scale figures. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to grab them and we're going to warp them around a little bit. So we can make some of the trees a little bit taller, except we're going to make some of the trees a little bit wider except if you've got like three trees, you can make about nine different combinations. The more that we repeat these options, the more they'll look repetitive. But the other thing we can go do is go into edit here and say transform and say flip horizontal. So we'll make a mirror of the tree. We're gonna hide some of the trees behind some of the other trees. We're going to stretch this tree to be bigger. We're going to say edit, transform, flip horizontal. We're going to erase part of this tree. Why? We're just going to erase this little fence line here. Cut that tree out and we're going to put it in there on top of itself. Grab this tree move it in here. I'm going to keep everything. And then last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab just some of the canopy and move that around and just put canopy in all the way in the background and I'm gonna stretch it out. And because we have these scaled lines, it's gonna look pretty nice. Now, it still looks like a big angry cloud. And that's because what we need to do now is add line weight. And we're gonna do that the same way we did it last time, which is we're gonna go in and we're just gonna say image adjustment and we can either do the levels or the brightness, uh, the hue saturation. So I'm going to go in here and say brightness contrast just to see. Move that up or back so I can make that a little bit darker. I can make it a little bit more contrasty. And then I can say make you a little bit more transparent. And then using control, I can work my way through the tree canopy and just make these a little bit more and a little bit less transparent. Grab the tree in the back and I'm going to work my way from the trees in the back forward just to give them a little bit more depth. Not a lot, but a little. Let's um, Let's take that white background and just dump some more white back here just to see what it looks like. Now, if I was moving this over into like InDesign, I would keep the checkerboard PNG background. I would just move the Photoshop file over. But just so you guys can see it on the screen as a check, let's just dump white into this backdrop. What do you guys think? Let's make it a little bit wider. So the question was 24. 
The question was, what can I do to ground my drawing so that they look more integrated? Well, the drawing convention that we need to follow would be that you need a horizon line. You need good line weights. You need enough information on the page. Hand drawing does a really good job of imbuing feeling, but it takes a long time to draw. Um, drawing like this, though, is really fast because we can copy paste and copy paste and copy paste. The danger is that it starts looking repetitive. So the shortcut is to use the computer for what the computer is good at and use your hand for what your hand is good at. Look at the detail that's in this section. We even have the glass in here. And if we zoom in, it actually still looks pretty darn nice. But we can also zoom out and we now have a site section. We could actually frame this a couple of different ways and have it be equally valuable no matter what. We could use it as an interior perspective. We could use it as a section drawing. Um, we could turn different things off if we wanted to remove the scale figures or the, the trees, we could do that. Um, if I just turn that off, it's like a section cartoon. It's almost starting to be a diagram now. So you can actually start to build many things out of this. This is part diagram, part section, part perspective. And of course, we can cannibalize this drawing for any other drawing. So once I've done the window, I can grab it and use it elsewhere. Once I've done the scale person, I can grab them and use them somewhere else. Um, let me just show you guys why I didn't choose to use these trees. Man, I use these trees sometimes. Actually, I know this PNG file really well. Um, we're going to use the same exact methodology. We're going to say color range, select the white, select inverse, cut. And we're going to go over here. We're going to say file new, paste. And what I'm going to do is just grab one of these trees. So let's go in here. And this is where having kind of multiple trees is really handy because then you can kind of build out the forest for yourself. So let's just cut that guy out. Take it to here and paste it in. So first of all, you can see it's it's a rather small image, whereas the uh, the image of, our, of the um, was much better. This is all right. But there's, um, there's a handmade goofiness of those hand drawings that I just love. And this Getty image tree just doesn't quite have it. I'm not saying it's bad. For your style, it might fit just fine. But I also wonder if there's a way to, if there's a way to put these together. that makes it work a little bit more friendly. And you can see like, what I tried to do was to get the big broad strokes down quickly. What I tried was to cannibalize existing drawings quickly. The background and the landscape is an essential part of the space, but it's not the whole story. The story is being in this room, looking at the landscape. So if I spend too much time on the landscape, or if I spend too much time on the architecture, I'm not really spending time on the story. What I really wanted to call out about the story is that this is a section, there's an amazing view, and you're framed not only by the window, but the cabin and the forest at large. So neat, none of these pieces need to spend more time. We don't need green, green grass. We do not need blue, blue sky. Um, as a matter of fact, for the ground, we did pretty good with just having some gray and having some white. And, uh, and if we run out of that, I can snag it again by zooming in here, grabbing the gray, and stretching it back out. Grabbing the light, stretching it back out. Okay. 
And the other thing I will say is, so even though it's small on my screen, I do this a lot where I try to, this is like where if you were drawing a drawing, you'd pin it up on the wall and you'd look at it from the back of the room, the front of the room and right next to the drawing. So if you guys see this now, it's a pretty clear icon. Actually, the trees might be a little too much. From here, it's a pretty good drawing. Uh, this guy needs to move. This guy needs to move over here. Um, but also, it's pretty valuable from looking at it this close as well. I'm more focused on the materials inside than I am on the fact that the, um, the brown line just kind of wrapped around it. Uh, there was some little details that we did to the door. Remember the door and the railings? Those were little tiny details, but they took about 20 seconds, so they were worth it. Now would be a good time to save. Um, our horizon line is a little messed up at the moment, so I can always go back and you know, just add that back in. But it's interesting, we've started to also evoke a, I don't know, a, uh, a language here. It's not quite photorealistic, but it's not exactly it's not exactly shabby either. I think it's actually showing us probably the the best of what we want our reviewers to look at. The other benefit to that is that the more there we go. The other benefit to that is that the more um, kind of playful the drawing is, the more time we spend talking about the design and the less time we talk about whether or not it's a pretty picture. And as a matter of fact, actually, I think the composition of this is very even and kind of settled. Um, I just have one last thing I want to do, which is that this tree is still bothering me. So any questions, go ahead and put it in the chat. If anything, you want me to go back over. Just going to do a little hue saturation, desaturate that, make that a little lighter. And I'm going to go in here and actually make some of these trees lighter too. Image adjustment, hue saturation, make that a little lighter. Same thing with this guy. Image adjustment. And the nice thing about this is like we have been using hue saturation, levels, brightness the entire time. Uh, I, can see, I see a little thing that needs to get fixed right here. I have a small problem right here. And so we're just going to cover that over. There we go. We've even added a little bit of depth to the field of the ground. Not too shabby. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up there. As you guys are working on sections, elevations, perspectives, don't worry about being too photorealistic. Worry about if the drawing is conveying what it needs to convey. If it's faster for you to draw the proportions by drawing them in your notebook, taking a picture and moving them over, use that tool. If it's easier to colorize your drawing by taking a picture and then adding color, use that tool. The tools that you use in Photoshop the most, levels, cut and paste, magic wand, color selection, maybe masking, paint bucket. They're really the Crayola crayons of rendering. All other rendering that you're going to do is going to be a version of those tools at a higher level. But I don't think it's worth climbing the mountain of photorealism when you're here to tell the story about space. It's not that photography isn't important. It's that the story you have to tell is more important than whether or not the leaves on the ground look the way that it is. As we discovered earlier this semester, when you're working on stuff like this, it's impossible to capture the redness of an autumn tree in a camera. But if you do a good job of just hinting at it 
and telling us the story, our imagination will fill in the details. Um, I see this as actually a pretty wonderful forest and we only have about, we only have two different trees and we have, it's mostly a forest made out of the same tree. And uh, I'm okay with that because it's doing what it needs to do. Um, probably a little bit of uh, drawing to do in the trunks here. This isn't done yet, but I'm gonna stop it there. Thanks guys, I hope this was helpful. All right, we're gonna stop recording.